I want to briefly mention our ongoing labor negotiations with the IEA unions. We are all aware of the reports of the strike authorization votes that have been taken this week. I'm extremely disappointed with this action for a number of reasons. I strongly believe an agreement can be reached if both sides are willing to spend the time needed to work through the issues realistically and in good faith. I assure you that the board's bargaining teams have been working hard to reach a mutually acceptable settlement to the contract dispute, and we will continue to do so. I am optimistic that we're making progress at the bargaining table, not in the media. And I also want to assure you that the board's bargaining teams are willing to meet as often as necessary to conclude this matter. Our teams have made numerous concessions to these four unions in an attempt to reach settlement. We continue to explore options in a good faith effort to address the further improvements to the collective bargaining agreements that the IEA unions are seeking. Despite this strong desire to reach a settlement, I remain committed to reaching fiscally responsible solutions with all of our bargaining units. Solutions that do not overcommit the institution, pass heavy tuition increases onto our students, require layoffs, or tie our hands to make improvements in all areas of our university. We have posted information on my website around noon today to respond to the many questions being raised about this situation. We must be cognizant of our current financial situation, as well as the forces at work in Illinois and nationally that could significantly impact our students, our faculty, and our staff. Our context has changed, and both sides must do the same. For instance, the Faculty Association leadership has recently suggested in the media that, in quotes, increases in tuition from year to year should cover the losses from the state, end quotes. Obviously, we cannot agree to such a view. As you recall, in addressing the 15.3 million shortfall in fiscal 11, we still faced a structural deficit last year of 5.7 million. Thanks to the sacrifices made by all employees, including unpaid, closure days, the continuing hiring freeze, the reductions in other than salary budget lines, we ended the fiscal year with expenditures reduced to within our budget and enough cash balance to cover our payroll and our bills through this summer. By implementing an additional permanent 2.2% budget reduction across the campus, we erased the remainder of our structural deficit and entered this academic year projecting a balanced budget. It is important to note that we ask you to take unpaid closure days to avoid widespread layoffs. You should know that your sacrifices saved the jobs of 75 of your colleagues. We continue to hold the line on hiring and have more than 280 vacant positions across the campus. We eliminated one vice chancellor position consolidated administrative departments, reorganized, and restructured. Everyone is working harder with heavier responsibilities. We prioritized 19 faculty hires, and this fall welcomed a small but talented and diverse cohort of academic colleagues, a cohort that's one-third the size of past years. Our fiscal environment remains uncertain at best. The state owes our university roughly $75 million. And while we continue to make positive strides with enrollment, this fall's decline of 1.1% cost the university approximately $1 million, which we must yet address. 
We must also consider our students and their families and recognize that anxiety over tuition and costs of education has never been higher. We must not make unwise or careless choices that will impact tuition. We remain concerned and will continue to advocate for the state honoring its commitments to higher education, including the Monetary Assistance Program and Veterans Grants Funding, both of which have been reduced, delayed, and continue to be uncertain in the future. We are also closely monitoring the discussions in Springfield regarding employee benefits, most notably pensions. This is an issue that touches all of us and is a key priority of President Pichard. I appreciate his leadership. Be assured that we will continue to be actively engaged in protecting the benefits that you have earned. Performance funding of higher education, as you know, will soon be implemented in Illinois. Here again, we are active participants in helping to establish the framework and the metrics to implement this new law, a new funding approach that we must embrace, one that is focused on completion and increasing the number of college graduates. The goal of the Illinois public agenda is to have 60% of the population holding a degree or certificate by 2025. Illinois currently is at 41%. I know you agree with me that SIU Carbondale is poised to contribute in significant ways toward this goal. There are stark realities at the federal level that demand our attention as well. The threats of federal support of higher education and support in the form of Pell Grants, TRIO programs, and other financial aid to students, basic research funding, graduate medical education, and yes, Amtrak funding, are very real and very important to us in our future. President Pichard and I are among presidents and chancellors from 65 institutions who have signed onto the letter crafted by the Association of Public and Land Grant Institutions to the 12 member Super Congressional Deficit Reduction Committee. This is the committee charged with developing a deficit reduction plan over the next several weeks for an up and down vote in the House and the Senate. This letter urges the committee and Congress to reach a balanced agreement that reduces budget deficits, reins in national debt, and creates economic and job growth. In part, the letter states, quote, the deficit reduction legislation will need to prioritize expenditures and economic growth must be an important consideration in making those decisions as well. Education, scientific research, and innovation underpin our economic growth in this area of enhanced global competitiveness, end quote. The letter also states, end quote, for our nation to create jobs and new industries, there should be a sustained federal commitment to scientific research and to ensuring that every citizen has access to higher education. It is important that we hold fast to our traditions that have made this university so great, the traditions that embrace access and inclusion and that is focused on excellence. At the same time, Circumstances demand continued innovation in every corner of our campus. As a recent report by the Deloitte Corporation notes, universities of all sizes, public and private, nationally and internationally, are confronting many of the same issues. This report, Making the Grade, 2011, identifies the 10 critical issues facing higher education that will sound familiar. They include, of course, funding, competition to attract the best students, the importance of establishing priorities, the need for upgrading technology, using physical assets more effectively, linking programs to outcomes that meet the needs of industry and society, attracting and retaining talented faculty, creating a more sustainable future, 
access to education, and greater transparency that meets the expectations of funding agencies, accrediting bodies, students, and our many stakeholders. That study concludes, in quotes, as one of the most important sources of new ideas and research in almost any country, institutions of higher learning must step up and find new ways to meet the challenging needs of their citizenry, despite limited funding. Indeed, it could be viewed as their civic obligation to innovate and evolve, to do more with less, and to ensure that individuals continue to contribute to the global competitiveness of their economy." End quote. So we cannot ignore our challenges, nor can we allow ourselves to be paralyzed by them. We are making progress in transforming the culture of our university. We are doing a better job in managing our finances. We have realigned and restructured to save money and to provide better service. All of our efforts revolve around ensuring student success. I believe there is also stronger recognition in the communities we serve that it is essential to them that this university not only survive, but thrive. We need only to look at the recently released economic impact study to understand the importance of this institution to not only the region, but the entire state. 2.3 billion. According to our economic impact study, that's how much this university contributes in annual economic activity to the Illinois economy. This is an important study, and I'm grateful for the hard work and attention to detail of its authors. Professor Shabash Sharma, Chair of the Department of Economics, Abu Bakar Diaby, a graduate student in economics, and Kyle Harsh, Executive Director of the Southern Illinois Research Park. Many, many people across the campus and in our School of Medicine contributed key data and information. Here are a couple of other important numbers in the study. For every dollar appropriated by the, to the university by the state of Illinois, we generate roughly $7.72 in economic activity annually. And of each of those dollars, 41 cents is returned to the state and local governments in annual tax revenues. In southern Illinois, defined as the 23 most southern counties, SIU Carbondale contributes $859 million in total annual activity. Directly and indirectly supports more than 12,000 jobs and generates approximately $551 million in personal income. During fiscal 10, the School of Medicine in Springfield contributed nearly $332 million in total annual economic activity in their 10-county region. The School of Medicine supports directly and indirectly more than 3,800 jobs and its activities generated $14.5 million in direct and indirect taxes for the state. This incredibly valuable report is available on my website, and if you have not read it, I strongly encourage you to do so. I want to remind you of just a few of our accomplishments over the past year, because again, we cannot allow our challenges to obscure your valuable and ongoing contributions. Our many successes reflect the passion and commitment you bring to campus each day. Earlier this month, U.S. News and World Report published its annual Best Colleges Ranking. As we all know, while no set of rankings can tell a complete story, the reality is that they matter to prospective students and their families. So we need to pay attention as well. We moved up in this year's listing of best national universities from 170. Our ranking last year, a year ago, was 183. And among all public institutions, we ranked 94th. As this chart shows, no other Illinois institution made as much of a jump as we did. Another way of thinking about this is that we are among universities considered to be top tier. Keep in mind, 
the national university list includes only 251 universities. So it's an honor to be on that list, and it's really an honor to be 170th on that list. We continue to demonstrate impressive strength in several categories that bring us into the ranking. Our high percentage of full-time faculty, 95%, and our low percentage of classes with 50 or more students, 6% reflect our emphasis on providing an environment conducive to outstanding teaching and research. Additionally, our rate of retention went up 1% and our graduation rate increased 2 percentage points. There is another set of rankings I want to share with you, rankings that don't generate the widespread publicity that surrounds U.S. News rankings, but that I consider an important barometer of our progress. This summer, the magazine, Diverse Issues in Higher Education, published its annual Top 100 undergraduate degree producers and top degree producers among graduate and professional programs. We earned recognition in 29 undergraduate and 15 graduate categories, including once again a remarkable top ranking for baccalaureate degrees in education awarded to African American students. And we broke into the top 100 for bachelor's degrees in all disciplines awarded to minority students. We also see a strong indicator of our commitment to diversity and student success in this ranking. We are 49th among all universities in conferring bachelor's degrees to all disciplines, in all disciplines to African American students. And among traditionally white institutions, we rank 30th for the number of bachelor's degrees awarded to African American students. Recognition such as this is worth celebrating because it reflects the long-standing commitment of our faculty, staff, and students to inclusion and diversity. It also encourages us to do more. We are poised, in fact, to take important steps to strengthen our multicultural efforts. I recently received the recommendations of the Task Force on Multiculturalism and Diversity and I appreciate the leadership of Dean of Students Peter Gatow, Linda McCabe-Smith, Associate Chancellor for Institutional Diversity, and Task Force co-chairs Harvey Welch and Ella Lacey. The Task Force has proposed creation of a Center for Inclusion of Excellence that would have four key components. Inclusive excellence in teaching, research, and learning, in campus programming, in student support, and in community relations. Let me share with you a few other causes for celebration. The National Security Agency and U.S. Department of Homeland Security designated our Information Systems Technology Program as a National Center of Academic Excellence in Information Assurance Education. We are extremely proud of the faculty and staff in the program for achieving such a prestigious designation. The Counseling Center's pre-doctoral internship program in psychology was fully re-accredited for the maximum seven years by the American Psychological Association Commission on, on Accreditation. That in itself is a noteworthy achievement, made even more so when you consider this. The Counseling Center's internship program has been fully and continuously accredited since 1974, making it the sixth oldest accredited program housed in a university counseling center within the United States. That's a remarkable history of achievement. The College of Business also earned reaccreditation from the Association to Advance Collegiate Schools of Business, the highest tier of accreditation. This places the college in the top 5% of schools in the world. In addition, the School of Accountancy earned a separate accreditation from the same association, placing it in the top 4% of accounting programs in the country. And just last week, the Rainbow's End Child Development Center, an important resource on our campus, earned its accreditation. As you know, we now offer students 24 hour per day access five days a week to study areas on the first floor of the Morris Library. My thanks to Dean David Carlson and his staff 
and Director of Public Safety Todd Siegler and his staff for their collaboration on this effort. The library is now pursuing the purchase of a significant collection of streaming videos that will be available campus-wide and at home to authorized users. The collection will contain several thousand high-quality videos for education and research and will cover such topics as American history, counseling and therapy, dance, nursing, world history, and filmmakers. This will be an important new resource for classroom use as well as for distance education programs and students. There is much to be proud of within athletics. Yes, there have been and continue to be many successes in competition, but the athletic staff and our student athletes are very focused on academic success. The departmental GPA for the spring 2011 was 3.06. 14 of 18 sports earned a GPA of 3.0 or higher for that semester, led by the softball team with an impressive 3.55. The men's cross country team ranked second in the nation. Yes, second in the nation with a 3.6 GPA. One other impressive figure, nine out of 10 student athletes who compete for four years earn degrees. Community service is a priority of our athletics department as it is campus-wide. I want to make special mention of the efforts of one of our football players, senior Mike McElroy, one of three academic All-American players. Mike wanted to do something to help fight cancer and through sheer determination gain special NCAA approval for his proposal blackout cancer. Here's how it works. People can bid to have the name of someone they know who was or is affected by cancer. Have that name placed on 80 Saluki players jersey for one game which will be November 12th at home against Eastern Illinois. Bids are being accepted to have names placed on the jerseys and after the game the players will give their jerseys to the highest bidders. As of early this week, the 80 highest bids total $41,000. Mike, we know you have to leave for practice, but would you please stand so we can acknowledge you. Thank you. There are so many wonderful examples of volunteerism throughout the campus. In fact, between August, 10th, uh, August of 2010 and July of 2011, more than 3,200 students in the Saluki Volunteer Corps contributed nearly 44,000 hours of service. And we are inspired by so many of our students. Uh, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, the commitment of Jessica Stout, a University Honor student, Jessica has been involved with Up Till Dawn, registered student organization for the past two years, including serving as executive director. In the group's two short years, it has raised more than $100,000 for St. Jude Children's Hospital. Up Till Dawn earned Program of the Year, and Jessica was named Executive Director of the Year at this summer's St. Jude Children's Research Hospital Collegiate Leadership Seminar. Being the dedicated student that she is, Jessica could not join us today due to her academic commitments. Nonetheless, she and all of the Up Till Dawn members deserve our congratulations. <laughs> Service is the focus also for third year law student Angela Rollins. The Illinois State Bar Association honored Angela, who is a two-degree graduate of our university with the 2011 Student Division Public Service Award. Her efforts have included the Downstate Illinois Innocence Project, the Law School's Immigration Detention Project, Land of Lincoln Legal Assistance Foundation, and the Law School's Domestic Violence Clinic. She ended last academic year second in her class as well as getting awards for all of these volunteer activities.
Commitment to outreach and service has been a long-standing hallmark of our faculty. Geology professor Nicholas Pinter, who is well known for his work with river systems and floodplain management, is leading a group from our university that is helping Olive Branch move. Yes, that's right. They're focused on moving an entire town. The 800 residents suffered major damage this spring from flooding on the Ohio River. This is, in Professor Pinter's words, an enormously complex project that will take a couple of years. But they achieved an important milestone just two weeks ago. Working with Alexander County officials, more than 90% of the property owners signed onto a $12 million buyout application that was submitted to FEMA. Professor Pinter is quick to credit his team with this dedication, noting that staff researcher Beth Allison has been making almost daily trips to Alexander County. James Blackburn, who is a professor of mechanical engineering and processes, is reaching out to international communities. He is developing a potentially life-saving sanitation system that will use only naturally occurring biochemical processes and wind power to operate. Professor Blackburn's project captured the attention of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which awarded him a 100,000 grant challenge grant. If all goes well during the pilot phase, Professor Blackburn could qualify for a million dollar grant from the foundation to install his systems in a developing nation for further testing. And we also continue to play an important role in the future of Afghanistan. At the request of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, faculty in the College of Agricultural Sciences are participating in a program called ADAPT, Agricultural Development for Afghanistan Pre-Deployment Training. We are one of four universities participating in training at Cal State Fresno, but our faculty members are the only ones with experience in Afghanistan. We helped train members of the military and civil civilians just last week who are preparing to deploy to work specifically on agricultural development. This important work includes training Navy SEALs and members of the Special Forces who will go on into 2013. Our members uh, of our faculty and students also earn well-deserved honors. For the first Third, for the third time, I'm sorry, in four years, the half-hour alternative TV news magazine, Alt News 2646, was named the best collegiate television magazine news show in the nation. The competition for this prestigious college television award is at the highest level. Our student-produced entry earned the award over and beat out University of Southern California's Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism and the Art Institute of California in Los Angeles. The Alt News Honors are also a credit to Jan Thompson, Associate Professor of Radio Television, who is faculty advisor. Later this fall, PBS stations across the country, including WSIU, will air Jan's documentary on the Bataan Death March. Actor Alec Baldwin will narrate the program, which features firsthand accounts from 15 survivors. It airs on WSIU on November 11th. The Flying Salukis also brought home the well-deserved National Intercollegiate Flying Association Championship. In addition, the women who competed in the 2011 Women's Air Race Classic placed third in the collegiate division and fifth overall. These successes continue to reinforce what we already know. Our aviation program is among the nation's leading degree programs, and these accomplishments are a tribute to the dedication of our students, faculty, and staff. We also know, year in and year out, the debate team has great success on the national stage. Director Todd Graham and his team are off to another solid start, winning top honors in the first two tournaments of the season earlier this month. I'm excited about a new program spearheaded by the College of Science that will transform the way we engage middle school students in science. This is a $3.25 million project funded by the National Science Foundation 
that will provide science and teaching knowledge and training for 20 exceptional master teacher fellows in the high need fourth to eighth grade schools of rural southern Illinois. Each fellow will be supported for five years and will gain mastery on how science works by conducting research in the Cache River wetland. Partners of this outstanding educational outreach effort are the College of Education and Human Services, Shawnee Community College, and the Boys and Girls Club of Carbondale. My thanks to Karen Renzaglia, Professor of Plant Biology and Associate Dean of the College of Science, and Harvey Henson, Assistant Dean in the College, for their leadership on this outstanding program. Our researchers and scholars continue to contribute meaningful knowledge and solutions locally, nationally, and globally. For example, our School of Medicine faculty received $16.5 million in new research awards in fiscal 2011 to continue vital research in such areas as cancer, Alzheimer's, and hearing loss. During the last fiscal year, SIU Carbondale had 250 research projects underway and 121 faculty members had externally funded projects. Let me share with you a few examples of important grant funding that we have received since that report, since July 1 of 2011. $749,000 to WSIU for digital transition. $2.5 million to Kathleen Campbell in the School of Medicine to study noise-induced hearing loss, a series of grants that she's received. A five-year, $1.8 million award to Buck Hales in the School of Medicine for his important ovarian cancer study. A $700,000 grant to Mark Bird in physics for quantum computer science. And a $1 million grant to David Gilbert in psychology to assess the impact of nicotine patch treatment on ma marijuana withdrawal symptoms. These are just a few examples of the good work that we do. Last fiscal year was also productive for commercialization. We disclosed 25 new inventions, filed 16 new patent applications, received six new patents, which is a record for one year, and executed five new licenses with industry. Our academic offerings continue to evolve. Thanks to our faculty's commitment to providing students with undergraduate and graduate curriculums that respond to the needs of industry and society. Among the new degree programs and specializations are master's degree in art history and visual culture, the doctoral program in criminology and criminal justice, a bachelor's degree in international studies, a fashion specialist degree within the fashion design bachelor's program, a new undergraduate specialization in digital arts and animation, and a master's degree in fire service and homeland security management. As you can see, we will continue to explore opportunities to enhance our curriculum, and we have also a new task force that the provost office is convening to examine academic policies across the campus to ensure that our existing policies are promoting student success and that our policies are consistent with one another. You will recall that one of my chief goals from a year ago was to pick up the pace of distance education and place greater emphasis on the campus. I want to share with you a few highlights of the progress we're making. Since we established the Office of Distance Education and Off-Campus Programs on July 1st of this year, 31 online and off-campus courses have been transferred to the academic units. 16 new online courses are being developed for next spring as a result of online course development grant funding. And we anticipate that in the spring of 2012, Academic units will offer 75 online courses and 80 off-campus courses. We currently offer three online degree, degree completion programs, including the master's degree in manufacturing systems with the College of Engineering. Just a few days ago, we received an email from a student serving in the military in Kuwait. The sentiments expressed 
In that email, underscore the importance of our distance education and off-campus programs, and shine a spotlight on the outstanding services we provide to active duty military and student veterans. Specialist John McShane left school during last semester after receiving deployment orders. He still achieved a 3.2 GPA. In his email, John said he is taking six credits online, and though he will miss his senior year, he expects to return to school next summer and graduate in the fall. Here's part of what he wrote in quotes. By being so military friendly, SIU allowed me to miss countless school due to the military, but I am only graduating a semester later than my peers. I just wanted to thank you for SIU having such a great policy and being so friendly to veterans. It really did make this process so much easier." End quotes. That's a great example of the positive difference we're making in the lives of our students. Also new this year is the Center for Teaching Excellence. The center, which incorporates the team of in instructional support services, is designed to provide comprehensive leadership for teaching and learning throughout the campus. As you recall, the Center for Teaching Excellence concept was discussed about a year ago. And on July 1st, with its inception, they have been busy. They have scheduled a full day teaching and learning with technology symposium for October 20th and will be sending invites to all faculty staff on campus. We have also implemented many important changes in the area of student support. As you know, this is the first full academic year for the University College and I appreciate the leadership of Julie Payne Kirchmeier, Assistant Provost for the University College, and Professor Mark Amos, Director of Saluki First Year. This new alignment, which includes Saluki First Year, new student programs, university honors, university core curriculum, and six other units, will lead to more collaborative, transformational, and intentional programming to best help our first year students obtain necessary skills and experience. Expanding on the success of the first Saluki startup from a year ago, the fall 2011 version included the addition of the new student convocation, the Inside Scoop program, which provides students with key co-curricular information they need to know prior to courses starting, and an expansion of Saluki survivor skills that included a session with new students and academic advisors. More than 1,700 people attended convocation, and the impressive processional included more than 130 faculty members. Throughout Saluki Startup, students interacted with each other, faculty, staff, alumni, and returning students. Our assessment for Saluki Startup by students indicates that as a result of their participation, students feel more comfortable, more prepared, better connected, and have a stronger understanding about what is expected of them. Many, many people volunteered their time during move-in and Saluki startup to help our new students and families feel welcome. And I want to share a story with you about the efforts of one of our student center employees, Jennifer Donau. Jennifer volunteered to help with move-in on two days for a couple of hours prior to beginning her shift. On her drive from Johnson City, she passed a car that had broken down on the interstate. She noticed it was loaded with clothes and a refrigerator, kind of a telling sign that it was a student. At the next exit, she bought bottled water for the family and went back to help them change the flat tire. She learned that the family was headed to campus with their new student but wasn't sure exactly where to go. She had them follow her to campus and help them find people who could offer assistance. Before leaving them, she made sure they knew where to go next. And after all of that, Jennifer still went to Schneider Hall to help other families move in. 
Clearly, Jennifer made a lasting impression on these new members of our Saluki family. Jennifer didn't know I was going to make these comments, but I believe she is in the audience. And could she please stand? Thank you for the example you set. As part of our focus on student success, we engaged the services of a nationally recognized academic advisor consultant, Lynn Freeman, during the summer. Dr. Freeman visited our campus and met with key stakeholders involved or interested in the undergraduate advisement process, including students advisors, chief academic advisors, enrollment management directors, uh, new student program uh, uh, staff, deans, and other administrators. Dr. Freeman has provided her draft report, including key recommendations, and we will take steps to improve academic advising to our students. We need to recognize that advising is a cornerstone of retention and that our advisors are very much a part of the solution of our retention issues. We also have in place a newly revamped early intervention system, which is designed to provide early information on students who struggle academically, socially, or otherwise. The goal is to work with faculty advisors and key staff to assist in identifying students who may be having challenges in the classroom or in other areas and connect them with key resources. A key collaborator for this initiative is the Saluki CARES team, and Lisa Peden, Director of Learning Support Services, has been working with this team to ensure students receive the assistance they need. Only through expanding the involvement of people across campus can we continue to make the university college as efficient and effective as, and as extensive as we need it to be. We want it to be visionary and turn the culture of the campus to re-emphasis on commitment to undergraduate education. It is not merely enough to retain the students we admit. As an opportunity, we have as a university to provide them with the tools, academic, social, and developmental necessary for them to excel. I'd like to switch to a more sober topic, but one that I also think we've made progress. Deferred maintenance on the campus, which now stands at more than $517 million, remains a significant issue. As our nation and state continue to struggle with the economy, it's unrealistic to expect much help in the form of new state support. That means we have to be very strategic about how we allocate limited resources. We are continuing to make progress with physical improvements with funding from the facilities maintenance fee, some state funding for repair and maintenance, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and storm insurance proceeds. We also continue to address the broadband and electrical needs of the campus. You certainly can see the many improvements around Campus Lake and in the woods. And as part of the campus renovation and restoration effort, we anticipating planting 150 to 200 trees in November with the help of volunteers. There is a remarkable volunteer effort going on right now that I'd like to draw your attention to that involves repaving of the path around the lake. E.T. Simons Construction Company has provided material and equipment for the project, and Laborers Local 773 is providing labor as part of the training initiative with the Labor Employers Cooperative Education Trust. I know that many of you, like me, truly appreciate one of the most scenic parts of our campus, and we appreciate the wonderful partnership that will result in these much needed improvements. At the Southern Illinois Airport, construction of our long-awaited Transportation Education Center is 55% complete and on schedule. 
This fall, we now have 20 new high-tech classrooms on the campus, doubling the previous number, and these improvements facilitate teaching and learning. We also made significant improvements to the agricultural building this summer, and a major HVAC painting carpeting project throughout Fainer is underway. We also have been able to upgrade chemistry teaching labs through a great partnership with Bob and Beth Gower, both proud alums of our university. Their gift helped establish a technology fund in the chemistry and biochemistry department, and we are grateful for their investment in our students and faculty. We are continuing to pave the way, that's a pun, for our new Student Services Center building. Something I'm confident we can all agree is long overdue. Construction of the new facility, which will be built where the parking garage now stands, is expected to begin in the spring of 2012. The parking lots just east of the parking garage were enlarged and, yes, paved this summer uh, to uh, expand spaces in anticipation of the demolition of the garage. And more work is in store this fall at the McAndrew Stadium site including removal of the track and installation of additional parking from the 50-yard line south. Earlier this week, we opened the new interior roadway to the Southern Illinois Research Park. The roadway, funded primarily through a $1 million federal appropriation, provides a direct connection to the central part of campus and will encourage further development along US Highway 51. We also broke ground for a new multi-tenant facility at the research park. We're also taking a long-term look at housing. For the past nine months, we've been engaged in a master planning process that includes a comprehensive market, financial, and facilities review. The consulting team, with the dedicated staff from many campus departments, have paid specific attention to Greek Row, Southern Hills, and East Campus to analyze the current and future competitive position of our housing options in terms of types of unit, price, amenities, and services. We expect to share the 15-year master plan with the campus toward the end of the semester. It will include an evaluation of our current housing options and recommendations for construction of future housing to meet the needs of our students and future students. When we came together a year ago, I had the pleasure of announcing the continuation of our full institutional accreditation for the next 10 years by the Higher Learning Commission. While they granted full accreditation, the commission expressed concerns about our financial situation and requested an update on our budget in 2011. In addition, the Commission will conduct a site visit in spring of 2013 to review our progress with planning. I'll come back to strategic planning in a moment. Our financial report was accepted without reservations by the Commission. The analysis of our report by the Commission staff is a strong endorsement of the steps we have taken over the past year by respected professionals in higher education. Here is the staff comment. The progress report submitted by SIUC gives strong evidence and detail regarding the university's ability to address its financial challenges effectively. In spite of the challenges posed by the state's financial uncertainties, SIUC has taken sound and well-considered measures to assure its continued financial health. Continued careful monitoring and sound planning, particularly with respect to safeguarding and enhancing enrollment, will be necessary in the university's strong future. I'm proud of the efforts of our campus to address our financial stress this past year, and I'm particularly grateful for the Chancellor's Planning and Budget Committee, academic deans, unit directors, and vice chancellors for their assistance and support during this difficult time. As the Higher Learning Commission emphasized, 
the best way to secure our financial future is through growth. And while total enrollment was down 1.1 percent this fall, I do not consider it an exaggeration to suggest that thanks to the hard work of many, many people, we are turning the corner. It's important that I take a few minutes to review the progress we've made. This fall, we welcomed nearly 20,000 new and returning students to campus. For the first time in four years, our new first-time on-campus entering undergraduate enrollment increased more than 5 percent. This increase of 116 students is a major turnaround from a year ago when we had a decrease of 136 students. Transfer student enrollment grew by 3.2 percent, continuing a trend from last year. Clearly, our renewed focus on this critical area is having a positive impact. In addition, we created an Office of Transfer Student Services and revitalized the SIU centers at the regional community colleges. We increased staff presence and added training, technology, and connectivity. I made visits to several community colleges in our regions and in the Chicago area and am hosting an ongoing series of community college retreats designed to enhance our partnership with our colleagues. Additionally, we are working with our seven southernmost community colleges to offer courses to their students. We have slowed the rate of decline among continuing students. While that category fell by 246, that is far fewer from last year's decline of 368. And our retention rate improves. We all know we must maintain our focus on helping students and their success. International enrollment continues to grow. The on-campus international undergraduate enrollment is up 16 percent across all levels. International enrollment increased more than 6 percent. And we also welcomed 19 new Fulbright students to campus this fall, an increase of two from the year before. Last POW gave us some wonderful recognition this week. SIU Carbondale was the first institution to be featured in the quarterly e-newspaper of LASPOW in recognition of the outstanding graduate education and international support we've provided for the past 30 years. That newsletter goes to 6,000 contacts in the U.S. and abroad. I think it is safe to say that our international reputation continues to flourish. External reviewers who are on campus today confirm our rich history and legacy in international studies and have told me that we now have great potential to grow in this area. We also continue to see growth in honors. University honors a year ago had 220 students. I announced at that time that we would double the number in five years. Our target was 320 for this fall on that growth model. In fact, thanks to the hard work of Director Lori Merrill Fink and her staff, faculty and academic advisors, advisors throughout the campus, we've surpassed that goal and currently have 341 students in the program, including 100 freshmen. And that is no small feat, considering that 54 students graduated from the program last year, so we grew while we were also graduating students. And there's a wait list, as you would expect, on every one of the 10 honors courses that are offered in the spring of 12. The progress we are making stems from, I believe, teamwork in the enrollment management and in our colleges. Turning around years of decline will take time, but I'm confident that our focus on student support and success, customer service combined with intensified enrollment management and marketing efforts will lead us in the right direction. While it has generated some controversy, the marketing and branding initiative is crucial to the future of this university. And it is far more than the new logo. Our research, I guess, I guess you knew that. Our research clearly shows that we've not been reaching the audiences that we need to reach. 
Our research was inclusive of faculty, staff, students, alums, parents, and high school counselors. We will use messaging that reflects who we are and the many accomplishments of our faculty, staff, and students. As you can see on the screen, it's time to change the story. What I've been struck by is how SIU's story is so compelling. It is home to nationally recognized research that is making an impact. It offers a challenging academic program for the highest achieving honor students as well as those searching for the right academic environment. Students experience a small, intimate setting where they have close relationships with professors. We know all those things. This new branding initiative is designed to ensure others outside of SIU family get to know them as well. I want to also remind you that no new dollars are being invested here. We have reallocated existing resources. Our marketing campaign for this fiscal year includes the brand rollout you saw at the beginning of the academic year. It also includes advertising and a variety of components, including website and social media and benchmark research. This effort includes exciting new materials, materials that most of you probably have not seen. And that's because we're not marketing to ourselves. We can't expect others to tell our story for us. Doing so, as we've learned through our research, results in unwarranted negative images of who we are and what we accomplish. Another key related initiative this year involves strategic planning. As you may recall, Professor Peggy Stocktail and Tom Britton are leading a very capable and dedicated committee that is guiding our efforts to create a new strategic plan. And there will be opportunities for broad campus involvement this fall. There now is a website devoted to strategic planning and it includes reports of the various topics compiled by members of the committee. We'll be seeking your input as, in such areas as mission, access affordability, research and creative activity, diversity of our student profile, student involvement in university governance, community relations, funding, and improving the university image in the surrounding community. There will be an interactive website, and I encourage you to provide input as the steering committee and I engage the entire campus in these conversations. Our strategic plan will clarify and expand SIU Carbondale's mission and vision, reaffirm our core values, and most importantly, provide action plans and metrics to help guide us to achieve our goals. It is a credit to our faculty and staff and students that we really have made so much progress this past year. And it is your resolve and your dedication that give me great confidence for the year ahead. In addition to completing our strategic plan, we will continue to implement and improve on recruitment, retention, and marketing efforts. We will continue to address our financial situation in a manner that is responsible and responsive to the needs of the university. There are no clear answers or solutions to the national and global economic crises, but we must craft solutions for us and move forward. We will strengthen the research infrastructure. We must examine our research administrative support, our physical facilities, and campus policies to ensure faculty are as successful as possible in their scholarly work. We will continue to build a strong advancement team in conjunction with the SIU Foundation and Alumni Association Boards. We will continue to improve the campus infrastructure, including housing, deferred maintenance, and new buildings. And through professional development opportunities, we will build exceptional campus teams. What is essential? to accomplishing these and other goals. Note my repeated use of the word we. Our continued progress will depend more than any other factor 
on our ability to strengthen our collaborative efforts, including strengthening our lines of communication with our shared governance structure and taking pride in our achievements. My address a year ago can be thought of as charting the course. My message today is that we are headed in the right direction and we must stay the course. The enemy is complacency. Thank you for your commitment to our students, to each other, and to the communities we serve. Big things are within reach at SIU Carbondale. Thank you.